Welcome, everyone. I'm Father Antonio Lopez. I'm the Provost Dean of the Institute. We've uh, organized today this, uh, this meeting. It's a book discussion. It was one of the things that we would like to do as uh, they come is as, as faculty publish these books, we would like to, to invite uh, speakers also to enter into a dialogue with what um, one of us has uh, has written a book takes a long a long time to to write it's much work and much much thought and uh, our interest in here is is not simply advertisement but uh yeah, enter into a discussion at a at a greater level so the first uh, one we'll do is uh, this one by dr schindler ordering love liberal societies and the memory of god as, uh, as you know, uh, Dr. Schindler is the uh, Edward uh, Gagnon Professor of Fundamental Theology here at the John Paul II Institute, and uh, he's also Dean Emeritus, right? He's been uh, um, also full professor at, uh, professor at the University of Notre Dame and uh, St. Mary's University. He's the editor of Communio International Catholic Review, and then also the editor of the series of uh, Resource Simon. Retrieval and Renewal in Catholic Thought with, uh, with Ermans. To discuss the, uh, the book with him, we've invited uh, two renowned scholars and good friends of us. You probably know them because they've come uh, to work with us here at the Institute. The first one is uh, Peter Casarella, who is currently an associate professor of theology at the University of Notre Dame. Prior to Joining the faculty at Notre Dame last year, he served as professor of Catholic studies at DePaul University, where he was also the director of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology. He has taught previously at the University of Dallas and here at the Catholic University of America. He's published almost 50 essays in scholarly journals and on a variety of topics. Some of his books are um, these ones, Cuerpo de Cristo, The Hispanic Presence in the U.S. Catholic Church, Christian Spirituality and the Culture of Modernity, The Thought of Louis Dupré, Cusanus, The Legacy of Learned Ignorance, and most recently, A World for All, Global Civil Society in Political Theory and Trinitarian Theology. The second uh, speaker, is Patrick Denin, who is the David Potenziani Memorial Associate Professor of Constitutional Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Previously, he served as speech writer and a special advisor to the director of the United States Information Agency and taught for eight years at Princeton University and for seven years at Georgetown University before joining the faculty of Notre Dame in 2012. He's published also numerous articles and is author or editor of the following books, The Odyssey of Political Theory, Democratic Faith, Democracy's Literature, The Democratic Soul, and uh, the last one, Redeeming Democracy in America. So Dr. Schinner will present um, in a synthetic way his, uh, his book first, and then uh, there will be responses by Dr. Casella and Dr. Dinin afterwards, to which uh, Dr. Schiller would like to respond. And then after that, uh, hoping that we'll have some time, there will be time for questions from, uh, from the public. After this evening is concluded, it's a reception uh, outside in the hall. And then we also have copies of the book on sale at a reduced price if any of you wants to commit this crime. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please join me in welcoming our speakers tonight. So, first of all, you, you can hear this? Okay. Um, 
thanks to Father Lopez for uh, initiating this series and, um, uh, and as he explained it, uh, what, what it's all about. And also thanks to my friends and colleagues uh, from Notre Dame, Peter Casarella and uh, Patrick Deneen. Um, for their w willingness to uh, engage in this discussion. Um, what uh, purpose here is to have a conversation focusing uh, s some of the main issues of the book. And uh, what I've decided to do in my presentation, uh, which I hope to keep to no more than about 15 minutes, um, uh, is to sort of indicate uh, the architectonic claims of the book rather than to go through and try to rehearse the argument itself. And um, I should say that I want to do that, I mean, in, in sort of in, in, in thematic terms. I mean, obviously, uh, the, book, the book has a, a larger argument. The, the chapters were written on different occasions and with different purposes and so on. But I tried to bring it together in the introduction and, and with some editing. Um, but also, uh, I want to say, you know, obviously, in uh, it's been three years now, uh, almost since the the publication, which means you know four years or whatever, and uh, one continues to think about these things. So, what I want to do is focus some of the key principles as I uh, what I take to be of the book, but as I now would would put them and in very uh, brief fashion, schematic fashion here, uh, mainly to flag the things that seem to me uh, are, the, are the sort of key claims uh, uh, relative to which one uh, needs to make a judgment uh, relative to any sort of uh, final assessment of the book. Uh, so that's my point, and so I will proceed more or less descriptively and, and schematically. The, uh, and in uh, three parts, uh, <clears throat> I will say a few things each, just taking the, the title of the book, um, uh, you know, Ordering Love, um, what, what's the point of that title uh, in the first part, because that's kind of the, 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 the fundamental positive affirmation that's guiding informing the cultural judgments and so forth. And then the second part will be uh, in light of that to flag uh, some things regarding the nature of the culture and then uh, and, uh, and, in light both of those in light of the memory of God, um, you know, the cultural implications for liberal societies and obviously in an in a important sense uh, that means America because I take America's liberalism to sort of be an index to uh, the liberalism throughout the world. And then the third part um, is to simply conclude regarding some, uh, uh, this, this, this larger question, you know, uh, uh, should we, is this positive, pessimistic, optimistic, uh, are we negative regarding the culture, affirmative, and so on. And I simply want to conclude uh, by flagging the principles that I that I, I try to assume in the working through of the whole. Okay, so those are the three parts. The first, I would simply say ordering love, the uh, publisher had some difficulty like that. He said it sounds a little bit like ordering a hamburger. You know, what, uh, can you change the title? And he wanted to change the title. Well, uh, no, the point is uh, that love is an order. Um, uh, that's, that's the key thing and the, and the key claim is that it's the order of, of uh, the basic order of reality uh, from top to bottom of our being and acting. That's sort of the, uh, a fundamental claim that to love uh, is uh, to bring order to something in some way. Now, uh, I have to sort out what that means and just let me flag a couple of things here, the key things in my understanding of that. Um, uh, the, the typical understanding of love is anthropological. We immediately think it's something that human beings do. 
Um, it's a subjective act of the human will. Uh, so it's essentially an anthropological reality. It's one act among it, many acts. We do all kinds of things and we also love. And uh, it's also a moral intention, uh, you know, sort of um, or how we order by way of motivation and intention the things in, with which we are engaged. Um, uh, that, that is what I want, to, one of the things, or a basic thing, uh, disposition in our culture that I want to, to uh, correct in, in the book or presupposition there. And so uh, what do I mean when I say that love is uh, the, the basic structure of reality? I mean a, a couple of things here. First of all, that being is gift. So the, 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 the reality that we know, the given in its deepest reality is gift, a matter of, of a receiving and giving that's fruitful. And giftedness goes to the deepest structure of things, um, to their logos. Um, and a couple of points then in that context uh, is first the, uh, that the gifted character of being, we say being is gift, it reveals, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, revealed in the transcendentals. That is, uh, it's there when you unpack that. It's a way of saying that, that being is, is true and beautiful, true and good and beautiful, qua given ultimately by God. Um, so in a sense that being in the first instance is useless. And that's a very important point in the classical sense. That is to say, it's useless because it, it has a deeper worth than what is merely useful. It has a worth in itself. So as given, uh, as it's there before us, uh, it's already true and good and beautiful. Um, so that's a, a, a crucial point. Then uh, secondly, second crucial point there, is that um, I understand uh, being as gift, this metaphysical claim to be personified above all in the created order in the child. That we see in a child, it's the personalization of, uh, of, of what is uh, good and true and beautiful by virtue of its very givenness. It's the fruit of a, a, a communion uh, in its innocence and so forth. Its sheer presence as such uh, makes a claim on us. And so, um, and uh, then in the background there, and I'll come back to this, it implies, if you have a child, it implies generativity. Uh, it implies a father and a mother. It implies a kind of generativity and fiat of sorts. But, uh, but in terms of the, the person there uh, and the child, this, to me, is a key way of affirming, uh, a, a primary way of affirming uh, metaphysics at, as meta-anthropology, which it seems to me goes to the heart of the pontificates of John Paul II and Benedict XVI, um, that uh, it's, it's really above all through the human person that we see the structure of being uh, generally. And against the backdrop of this, um, uh, uh, in, in my argument, uh, being his gift, that, son, that child par excellence is the child uh, revealed by God in Jesus. Um, that is uh, that, that uh, um, uh, Jesus in, in uh, uh, the word or verbum or logos become incarnate in Jesus Christ. So the event of the incarnation bears a word. And the word reveals the logic of love. And the, lo the logic of love is what? It's a child. The child, it isn't just per accidents. God has to become incarnate and so has to do the way human beings do. It's a revelation of the meaning of God of something that goes all the way back into the reality of God, childhood in God, an eternal childhood in God. So uh, the, uh, that is then the, the ultimate theological or Christological background here. 
uh, the revelation of the meaning of being is gift. So you have the logic of being born and birth, and that implies the fatherhood of God, the generativity of God. It implies the maternal fiat of Mary. So uh, then all of this together then is what uh, I mean by being his gift, sort of from the side of the object, if you will. Now from the side of the human act, um, um, the key here is, uh, I have it in my head if I can't find it here, um, but uh, from the side of, of the human act then, so the structure of reality as being his gift, the point is that the human act itself from its beginning and sort of from the, in, the inside out shares in this structure of gift in, in, a, in, in a free and uh, cognitive way. And a couple of points that I want to, to make there is that uh, there aren't two human acts. There's not an act of intelligence and an act of freedom. There's a single human act which has the dual dimension of freedom and, and intelligence. And there's a, a mutuality we could sp spell out. Uh, Aquinas uh, indicates that. And, and, that, and tied to that then is, is also a mutual uh, a unity within distinctness of the true and the good. So the point is there's no act of freedom that isn't mediated in some way by intelligence, and there's no act of intelligence that isn't guided in some way by freedom. Um, and uh, a second point then uh, that I want to make uh, in that context is that that act uh, is never first empty. And I think this goes to one of the many things that goes to the root, one of the root assumptions of our culture, which is you have a human act, and then you have the world as an object, and you have God as an object. Um, and so you have a kind of uh, initial in logical indifference of freedom or intelligence, that uh, I'm freedom and intelligence are the one human act is sort of uh, structurally yet to cognize the world or in any way to cognize God and is yet to choose the world or to choose God. Uh, my basic claim there is that, um, that the, the, the human act is already moved in its first movement uh, of intelligence and, and will is moved, ordered by, ultimately by God, initiated by God as the creator, but by what's true and what's good, um, and with respect to being. So what I, th th that's the, the key point there, though, so, the, so that we, we can't talk about a human act as sort of empty, and then we talk about, well, reality, then the, the world is simply an object of that. The point is that the human act from the inside out is uh, weighted, uh, it's, it's fundamentally um, ontological or metaphysical and religious in nature. Um, that's an important point. And it's, it's, it's already uh, implicated, so to speak, in truth and, uh, and in the good. I mean, Aquinas following Augustine, they diverge in many ways as they spell this out, but uh, the, in everything we know, we know God implicitly in everything we will. We love God implicitly. And Aquinas says in something that's very, uh, not very often noticed, that is, say, the transcendental nature of truth, where Aquinas says that knowledge, is in fact, is, an, is a quodomito effectus veritatis. That is, in a certain manner of speaking, it's the effect of truth. Now, how can you possibly say that? You can't say that on modern assumptions. That is, I'm in relation to the world, and therefore I can know it. Okay. That's sort of what I mean, and, and so it participates in the gifted structure. We'd have to say more uh, there, but I think that suffices. Now, that is the, um, the fundamental uh, assumption uh, regarding, that, that, that informs my judgment regarding culture. I need to keep an eye on the time here, which is going quickly. Um, 
what I want to say, first of all, regarding uh, the critique of culture, I really want to highlight this. I presuppose in that critique something like John Paul II's structure of sin. We have this constant problem that if you make a strong criticism, you're criticizing sort of the subjectivity, the subjectivity of the people involved. It's like Weber. People said Weber was wrong regarding <coughs> capitalism because people aren't uh, any more greedy today. And his response was, well, the claim that they are belongs to the kindergarten of cultural history. That, that he's not, it's the logic, it's a logic of greed, okay? So uh, I, I want to highlight that. What, what I'm talking about is the logic of the culture. Uh, the question of the, the, the subjectivity, that's a very complicated question. There's an intrinsic relation there, but there is a distinction that's important. Now, what I want to say about a liberal culture then, uh, essentially, is uh, the problem that I see in its logic is its abstractness and its distractedness. Its abstractness and its distractedness. Now, you know, what does that mean? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, that has to abstracted from what and distracted from what. We can spell that up. Well, from reality in its concrete wholeness in relation to God. That's what. And the problem is that we think often of an English Anglo culture as being very concrete. That's most often because we, <clears throat> we confuse the empirical with the concrete. The empirical is an abstraction uh, from the concrete. Um, now, there are so many ways I can talk about this and, and rather than talk about it generally, but I, I could talk in terms of the, the lack of, an, of a logic of genuine imminence or transcendence, no depth, no height, uh, just moving along the surface. Uh, logic of that, that the, that the culture typically doesn't see things in their wholeness, but in a fragmented way. I think in a fundamental way you could say what's well, a it's a pervasive logic of instrumentalism, one way to characterize it, and and then we'd have to sort that out. And culture also has no formative fiat. Okay, I could go on and on, but that's sort of abstract like that. Um, it's not um, uh, worthwhile. Maybe some of that will come out in the in the discussion. But I'd only say that when I go through. I go through economics and uh, uh, um, a chapter or two on economics, on uh, politics, on science, and on technology. And the point there is to show in each case um, how those orders are falsified by virtue of their abstractness and their distractedness. Um, and I could, and, and what do I mean by that? What I mean is, for example, when we talk about the economy, we talk about wealth and poverty, but then it's wealth and poverty in this reductive sense, abstracting from what wealth and poverty mean in their wholeness. And something analogous, we talk in terms of politics, um, our conception of rights, our conception of freedom in the political order is uh, uh, affected by um, it's, it's reductive because it isn't anchored in the whole of the human person in the way that I sketched uh, earlier. Science, um, mechanical order, I'd, and I'd be um, happy to talk a, a, bit, of, a bit more about that uh, also in the, uh, in the discussion period, um, and technology. But the point in each case uh, in, in other words, I think me mechanism still does prevail in physics. And, and, uh, uh, and I could say a word about that in terms of a physicist. I mean, that, but if we get into that sort of thing, I, I do discuss that. And it seems to me modern science um, is technological in a certain way. It, uh, it, it doesn't start sufficiently with the given and with nature as such. But all of that is, I, I just toss it out there and um, it needs to be seen in the context and the, the argument. The point here is primarily to say that, um, that, uh, that
that the problem here is not abstraction as such. We're all abstracting right now. There are all kinds of things from which you're abstracting from your mother's love and so forth and, and so on. We're abstracting from all kinds of things. There's no problem with abstraction. We do it all the time. It's necessary for human consciousness. What's the problem? The problem uh, is bears on the how of the abstraction. And when you abstract a, a, a part or an aspect, the question is how you understand its openness to the greater whole to which it is related. And in each of these examples that I take, um, that I indicate here, like economy, the problem is you first abstract what is meant by poverty and what is meant by wealth, and then work out a system that answers that question, that issue, on, in, in, ter in terms of those realities as abstracted. And then it comes back and adds in the rest of humanity, the relation to God, the relation to family, and so on. My point is simply that if you first separate wrongly two things that bear an intrinsic relation, such that one is conceived as uh, simply indifferent to the other, when eventually you do bring them back together, you will, fall, you will find out that you falsified both. Okay, you falsified the nature of the wealth and the poverty and the economy and what it means to be a family and what it means to be related to God and so on and so forth. That's the, my, my uh, key point. And so the overarching claim of my book <coughs> is, is, is essentially uh, in the end that um, only in the end, objectively speaking, only the saint can abstract properly. Only the saint. And, but that means, that's, that implies a definite reading of sanctity. The sanctity, I mean a sanctity in this full ontological, metaphysical, and religious sense. That is to say, um, the uh, one who sees the uh, distinction that w what being means is gift and, and sees the ontological difference and has some grasp of the implications of being and beings, I mean, some sense of that. I don't, we could, it doesn't mean, you know, having had to get a doctorate in that or something. But some sense of the giftedness of the structure of being and, and then ultimately some sense of how that all re relates to God as revealed in Jesus Christ, how all of this relates, uh, the world relates to God, sees that and lives that, okay, and, and acts that out with the whole of his being, okay, and, and it's in that context that one can make the, the proper distinctions, I, and, and, and this is a radical claim, but it seems to me it goes very much to the heart of all of this. Sanctity is not just a moralistic act, a kind of moralism. It is a, it's a way of being, acting, and seeing. It's simply another way of talking about love as the order of things. So that really is my claim. We need a comprehensive recuperation of sanctity as uh, uh, the, the, the objective context within which alone one can see reality for what it most truly is. Okay. Now, uh, I, I'm going over time here. I'm just going to go to the last section. But I would, if somebody just gives me the ever so slight uh, provocation to do so, I'd like to say something about the current UN statement uh, and how the, UN, U, the statement uh, by the committee, UN Committee on the Rights of the Child epitomizes what I think is sort of the logical end point of the assumptions of a liberal culture. And I think we need to ponder that. And I can say uh, a little bit about how that's so and why that's so. I suggest uh, you read through that. And, and you need to read through it in the context of saying that the substance of this will be the law of every Western democracy, maybe what, five years, 10 years, that's bigger than a postage stamp. 
Okay, and we need to see that statement in the context of what John Paul II said in Familiaris Consortio, namely that the future of humanity and the church passes through the family. Okay, but I, I'll just say more about that if I'm provoked. The, uh, the final thing that I want to say is that then the question, by the way, uh, Bernanos has this wonderful statement, it's another way of thinking about this, when he says that what's happening in modern society is the accomplishment of the incarnation in reverse. That is to say, there's an inversion going on, increasing disincarnation. And I think the, a, a paradigmatic expression of that is the elimination of the child. There are no children in a liberal culture. We need to sort that out. Okay. The final thing then, is this negative? Okay, is this uh, too negative regarding the culture? What about that? Uh, what, what, if, if it is it, it read that way, I can't help it. It's certainly not what I, I, I hope it to be. Pessimism and optimism are irrelevant terms, basically. They're purely secondary and not very useful. The question is hope that's realistic and a hope and realism that's rooted in the gospel. Okay, so the point I want to say regarding the culture is there, there are four sort of things we have to keep in mind in terms of entry into the culture. The key principle is we enter the culture by following the way God enters the culture. That's very simple. What is that? Creation, incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection. That is the goodness of creation, the goodness and beauty and truth of creation, that being is a gift at its core with all the uh, perversions and the skewings and disordering, it, that remains at the core. We live the, we, the affirmation of creation. Secondly, we, take, we do that by way of incarnation. That is, we take flesh in the culture, and we have to keep in mind the logic of the flesh. It's revealed God. It's the way of the child that involves the generativity of the father and the fiat, the maternal fiat. We can't bypass these. They have cosmic, cosmological, anthropological, cultural significance. And now, then this becomes a crucial point. Incarnation, what is incarnation? So you have affirmation of creation, you have incarnation. The point is, at this point, now we talk about crucifixion. What about that? Crucifixion, the point is, that's, there's no rejection there. It's key to see that. We enter, okay? And we enter, we take flesh, and it results in a crucifixion, which is to say that the entering means to enter with the dynamic for transformation of myself and all of reality in love. That's what we're called to do already in this life. It's not merely eschatological. Okay, so we... we we enter in, and the result is a rejection and a crucifixion. Now, Jesus is the only one that we can say didn't deserve it. I mean, so it's never a case of our not inviting it by our stupidity and our sin sinfulness and so forth. But we don't bypass it. So you have creation, incarnation, crucifixion, which means transformation. You don't embrace the culture and then add something. I mean, this is the typical thing. I'm going to get the great position at the top of the ladder and prestige, and then I'm going to influence society. The problem with that is by the time you get there, the addition you, you offer is so little and so moralistic uh, that it doesn't really amount to very much. Okay? The movement for transformation is from the beginning and all along the way. Now, and four is the resurrection. The point is... There's a joy that, that, that is operative all the way through, never ending, and is the, the final statement. The point is to see that there's an order, creation, incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, but it's indissoluble and there's something of each and the other. So right from the beginning, 
uh, that joy is there. And, 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 but the, the Christianity does not promise the elimination of the crucifixion. You know, we need to ask, I know this sounds fundamentalist, but I don't mean it to stop all discussions, but I think it ought to be a place to start. How did Jesus do with the elites? You know, I mean, that's sort of interesting to ask once in a while. And our answer is, yeah, well, that was, that was, those were the stupid elites of that time. We have much more sophisticated elites. Now we can enter in and do it and then sort of correct it a little bit. I'm not saying we don't enter the culture. It's just what I mean by realism and hope. So that, that's the, the, the final point. So that the, the final, fr final, but also there in the beginning, is the, the uh, emphasis on joy. The joy is there from the beginning and pervades, but there's an order. The joy, I, I know of no understanding of realism that eludes the crucifixion. In a certain way, you could say the essence of liberalism. Another way is that it promises all the benefits of Christianity without Christianity. That is, the cross. But th that's a problem. Okay, that's a quick outline of some of the things that I think I did go over time. Thanks. <laughs> When I <clears throat> left the tundra of South Bend for the balmy weather here, I was sure that I was going to shake this cold, but it didn't quite happen, so I apologize for the raspy voice. Ordering love is a most welcome labor of love, a vast leap beyond and radical departure from uh, David Schindler's groundbreaking book from 1996, Heart of the World, Center of the Church. By departure... I simply refer to the, to the fact that the new volume includes a few short sentences, uh, some clever similes, and this one I have to repeat to reinforce the point you just made, page 47. One can almost define liberalism as a massive attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. That was great. And a couple of footnotes less than one half page in length. Gratefully, the content remains at the same high level as before. How should one read it? It would be a mistake, I think, to consider ordering love as the latest barrage from the bunker of Comunio and its approach to the US culture wars. It is rather an original proposal grounded in to mystic metaphysics from Balthasar's original insights into creaturely relationality. And the thought of Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, particularly his reworking of Augustinian memoria as the anamnetic foundation of a formed conscience. First and foremost, I would like to applaud the distinctiveness of David L. Schindler's voice in the public square including the increasingly specialized and decreasingly public arena of academic theology. The proposal he makes in Ordering Love is much more than that of a theologian who read Communio Ecclesiology and embarked on a critique of modern Western culture. His predilection to an unapologetically metaphysical theology is strengthened and resolved by Gilson's prescient remark that the metaphysicians will live to bury their undertakers. This resoluteness applies in myriad ways to our encounter with reality. The application is obviously not a mechanical one, but the surprising versatility of the metaphysical point of entry still cannot be overemphasized, even with respect to cultural criticism. The range of the prudential application of metaphysical thought will impress even Schindler's critics. In this volume, he makes judgments about the essence, and that means the durability of civil society, the long-term effect of ecclesial charity on global economics, and the proper mode of abstraction in disciplines as disparate as mathematical, physics, and educational theory. What do I mean by versatility? Ordering love is versatile in the sense that I, as a college student, found Heidegger's essay 
on the question concerning technology to be versatile. I was deeply moved by the analysis and I began to look at texts and ideas and fields outside of philosophy and theology in unexpectedly new ways. Reading Ordering Love suggests a diagnosis of reality that can be tested in areas of experience that seem to have no relationship to one another. Each time the optic passes the test of remaining true to experience in a new domain, more and more connections between fragmented domains become apparent. This evidence, based upon perceptible signs, is part and parcel of the symbolic nature of reality defended by Schindler throughout Order and Love. Let me illustrate with a recent example from my experience of teaching uh, Notre Dame undergraduates, specifically non-majors, in a second required theology course. In this case, the course is called God and Dialogue, and in it I attempt, to, I attempt to introduce students to thinking about what Paul VI in Ecclesiam Suum called the Dialogue of Salvation, or prayer, and to see this Dialogue of Salvation as the foundation for all other forms of dialogue in the church and in the world. In this particular unit, I wanted the students to think critically about what Schindler calls the ontology of technology and how it's always already present in their approach to learning and especially to their learning to read scripture. Using Ivan Illich's In the Vineyard of the Text, we read about the studium legendi of 12th century monasticism. This form of desire and learning, so studium has that double sense, this form of desire and learning was truly foreign territory, but by the sa same token, illuminating for 21st century domers. Through dialogue about the text, several students came to recognize their dependence on virtual reality and how the instantaneous access to digital information dumbs them down. One young Mexican woman spontaneously confessed that she felt that because of internet and its use in her own education, she felt irreparably incapable of having a memory like the medieval monks. Now, I would, not I would not claim complete success with this experiment. Not everyone converted to Gilsonian Thomism. Many students in commerce and engineering simply wanted to know why I assigned a text with so many strange Latin terms. <laughs> I still drew a lesson from the exercise that accords well with one of the principal themes of ordering love. The post-postmodern metaphysical search for the memory of God, that's a mouthful, might also include a retrospective look at the technology of reading. Illich argues that reading as a book of nature, so very symbolic and thus Schindler-esque, became problematized as soon as monasteries alphabetized indices and turned the Lectio Divina into a liturgically mechanical and bookish project. We inhabit a world in which virtual reality overlays this late medieval and modern bookish culture inadvertently invented by medieval monks. Meanwhile, university administrators clamor in bewilderment that students are not absorbing as much as they once did from reading assignments. It seems that we are like those monks at St. Victor, inaugurating a new age of reading that is supposed to increase desire without knowing all the consequences of our actions. So I'm not advocating a position with respect to the use of new media. The Pope tweets, and people are proud that he tweets more than the last Pope tweeted. <laughs> but I'm simply reporting, I think, on the non-utopian breadth of Schindler's cultural criticism in Ordering Love. Second part, uh, remembering the metaphysics of God's memory. The return to metaphysics in order in love is of a distinctive sort, and it's easily misunderstood, uh, even by sympathetic readers. Schindler appears to link participating as a creature in the memory of God with the real distinction between being and essence. At the very least, these two twin claims play a pivotal role in many of the essays in the book. Since I did not find an essay that linked them explicitly, I'd like to offer a few reflections on what I see as the connection between these two themes and why making that connection is so critical today. Participating in God's memory is a Platonic Augustinian theme that was revived by Joseph Ratzinger 
In 1991, when he attended the 10th annual gathering for bishops on bioethics in Dallas to give a lecture on conscience. Looking briefly at this address also sheds light on the kind of moral theology in play in ordering love. Whereas the medievals, Ratzinger said, distinguished the two levels of conscience, namely conscience as syndaresis and as conscientia, Ratzinger introduced a new definition of the first level of conscience, a relatively new definition. He said, and I quote, this means that the first so-called ontological level of the phenomenon conscience consists in the fact that something like an original memory of the good and true, both are identical, has been implanted in us, that there is an inner ontological tendency within man who is created in the likeness of God toward the divine. From its origin, man's being resonates with some things and clashes with others. This anamnesis of the origin, which results from the godlike constitution of our being, is not a conceptually articulated knowing, a store of retrievable contents. It is, so to speak, an inner sense, a capacity to recall, so that the one whom it addresses, if he is not turned in on himself, hears its echo from within. He sees, quote, that's it. That is what my nature points to and seeks, end of quote. In other words, before there are acts of conscience, one can recognize in the human person the substrate of conscience, a being oriented to the good and the true as one's destiny. Conscience as anamnesis is foundational in two respects. It is the desire to discover one's origin, and it is a form of being that is addressed by one's origin. In both senses, it can be recalled in all persons. Schindler argues that modern liberal societies in the West have erased this endowment. It's not just forgotten like a lost pair of keys. All modes of access to this memory have been blocked. Schindler reinterprets, reinterprets Ratzinger's formal redefinition of conscience as a relational theory of human autonomy. So the seeming paradox, relational autonomy, is rooted in our metaphysical constitution as both essence and existence. Modernity fragments the relation by reinterpreting human freedom as logically prior to, if not antithetical to, anamnetic metaphysics. Modern liberalism's claim for neutrality falls apart in the face of this recognition of the power of memory. Metaphysically, there simply cannot exist a neutral stance with respect to the absolute to which is then added a constitutively relational stance. Either the constitution of relationality is present as a datum of, consci as a datum of consciousness ab initio, or there is no constitutive relationality. That is a powerful <clears throat> and powerfully metaphysical argument. Understood simply in that fashion, the relation to God's memory still depicts a static relationship to the absolute. Members of liberal societies are looking for practical solutions to the relationship between religious beliefs and the supposedly neutral state. They're also looking for a compelling account of human self-determination that is not coerced by religious authorities into unfree acts, a goal with which Schindler in principle and wholeheartedly agrees. So at this juncture, we need to recast the definition of what metaphysics, the definition of metaphysics, one that does not appear weakened in the face of liberal skepticism and post-Heideggerian insouciance, but rather strengthened by the challenge of reformulating its very nature and purpose in modern society. The Jesuit philosopher Eric Schwada rose to this occasion in his monumental work on the analogy of being. And I would like to quote him on this point and quote him from the newly appeared translation of John Betts and David Bentley Hart. The being, sein, which all philosophers take to be the primordial question and primordial datum with respect to everything else, does not subsequently have analogy as an attribute or something developing from it. Rather, analogy is being. And thus thought is noetically analogy. As this primordial dynamic, analogy is a rhythm, just as 
According to Pythagoras, the cosmos vibrates with a resonant rhythm. And just as, according to Plato, God is the measure of all things and all actions. Laws, Book 4. Only in the sense of such a rhythm and such a measure is analogy, quote, a principle, unquote. So the principle of anamnesis also can be understood in this fashion. In fact, I understood the metaphysics of memory in ordering love in terms of the analogy of being as a rhythmic principle, as a principle that resonates as a measure of all things and actions. Being in the memory of God pulsates through our, primordial, through our primordial being and our daily existence, precisely because being and existence are divided and composed in creaturely beings. So that's the real distinction in action. We cannot claim to know with the certainty of natural reason either the fullness of their whatness or the why of their thatness. Schindler's book thus deals with the rhythms of creaturely existence in their expression, in the daily vows that structure life, in political decision-making, and in the world of desires that form global markets of exchange. Most importantly, Schindler, as a disciple of this deeply Catholic way of thinking about reality in terms of the analogy of being, has got rhythm. That's my next conclusion. My final reflection concerns the role of Mary in ordering love. Mary in anthropology played a key role in Heart of the World, Center of the Church. The fiat of Mary served as a counterweight to liberationist activism, while not in the least separating the church from the struggle for life and death among the world's real victims. Mary, too, plays a key role in ordering love. Mary reveals the deepest meaning of symbolic ontology because she symbolizes in an exemplary fashion, being is being given. She is the profile of the feminine maternal side of the church, an attribute much admired by Pope Francis, and as such, a complement to the masculine filial love of John. Together, Mary and John give form to the vowed state of life of the laity in the world. Moreover, her Magnificat is a prayer, but not only a prayer that we put on our lips, it's a wise program for service to the Lord in the face of secularist abuses of activism. I'd like to briefly uh, attempt to carry forward these Marian insights with a complementary reflection, one drawn from, drawn from scripture and the witness of Marian piety throughout the globe. When Mary appears in a distinct culture, this appearance testifies to the seed of the gospel that faithful witnesses have planted in that, cult in that culture. The enculturated Mary thus belongs to the harvest that, occur, that can arise from placing the seed of the gospel in new soil. Her presence in the language and tongue of a distinct culture is supremely fitting, given that her identity in scripture is inextricably bound up with her being the spiritual embodiment of the daughter Zion. Just as Mary's witness to Christ becomes more and not less enhanced through her self-presentation as the daughter Zion, so too is her self-presentation, as for example, our Lady Guadalupe, or Our Lady of Chestahova, an enhancement rather than a diminishment of her role in self-description as a witness to Christ. The relationship between the daughter Zion, representing the Old Covenant, and the Marian apparitions of later centuries is meant only to offer an analogy about the process of enculturation. Schindler, in his reading of Balthasar's Ontology of Generosity, acknowledges in a very deep way the covenant with Israel as a concretization of God's total gift of self to creatures. Pope John Paul II defended enculturation in terms of a process of deepening the ecclesial communio. He said, the process of enculturation is the gradual way in which the gospel is incarnated in various cultures. On the one hand, certain cultural values must be transformed and purified if they are to find a place in the genuinely Christian culture. On the other hand, in various cultures, Christian values readily take root. Enculturation is born out of respect for both the gospel and the culture in which it is proclaimed and welcome. The Synod Fathers saw further enculturation of the Christian faith as the way leading to the fullness of ecclesial communio. Authentic enculturation of the Christian faith is grounded in the mystery of the incarnation. God loved the world so much he gave his only son. In a particular time and place, the Son of God took flesh and was born of a woman. To prepare for this momentous event, God chose a people with a distinctive culture, and he guided its history on the path towards the incarnation, end of quote. So the Pope ties enculturation closely 
to the taking on flesh of the word of God, and likewise to the reality of a full ecclesial communion. As the gospel takes, roots in, in a, takes root in a culture, its enfleshment is directly rather than inversely related to the permeation of all aspects of that culture by the word of God. The question of how the gospel can be presented to indigenous peoples accordingly must be broached with great wisdom. As Paul VI said, it will require an incubation of the Christian mystery in the genius of your people in order that its native voice more clearly and frankly may then be raised harmoniously in the chorus of other voices in the universal church. So Mary has her proper throne, but no throne apart from that of service to the person of the incarnate word of God. This is not a dethronement of Mary, but rather a specification of her proper place in the plan of salvation. Let me just conclude uh, with the final reflection about this um, enculturated Mariology and how it relates. I think that uh, in the ordering love, um, something like what Balthasar calls a real symbol, uh, that you see the very expressiveness of God's love for humanity in exemplary fashion in the Immaculate Mary. I think that this is also, I mean, following John Paul II and Balthasar, present in this idea about enculturation, that enculturation is not uh, a strategy for promoting the gospel or some other extrinsic end, but enculturation has to do uh, directly with the, with the fiat, with the giving praise to God uh, that Mary embodied in a perfect way. In that sense, evangelization involves incarnating the word of God in distinct cultures so that each distinct, complete reception of the faith becomes the center from which the universal church shares and partakes the koinonia with all the particular churches through a particular culture. This lesson about enculturation within the ecclesial communion hopefully complements the Marian wisdom that properly lies at the heart of ordering love. It also points again, I think, to the universality of David L. Schindler's metaphysical optic. Thank you for your attention. Well, one of the um, conclusions one draws from David Schindler's book is that one should begin properly with gratitude. I feel like I should begin with an apology. Uh, I'm just a simple country boy from Indiana, unlike, unlike Peter, who moved there only from the big city only a year ago. I, I've been there a year and a half. Uh, but, but more to apologize because I'm a political theorist in a den of theologians, uh, and uh, I'm not sure that... Uh, I will be introducing acceptable discourse, but uh, uh, since I've been invited and I can't pretend to be a theologian, I'll try to introduce some, uh, uh, perhaps a, to reflect on, on David Schindler's book uh, as a political thinker. But let me let me begin appropriately with a with gratitude and and um, and an expression of um, delight to have been asked to be part of this discussion today especially because it required of me to read a book that I was already reading when I was invited to participate, so that makes that task a lot easier. Um, and I certainly welcome the opportunity to reflect upon the book uh, more deeply. I don't think it will surprise any of you in this audience that the opportunity to think alongside David Schindler and to learn from him is a blessing and a gift. To encounter his work is to experience in some ways that economy of gift about which he writes that joy of gratuitousness that we know we can't repay, but happily we know does not await compensation. David's book is at once not a book in the usual sense, and it is more a book in an unusual sense. It was written not as a book, as he acknowledges, that it is a collection of various essays and lectures that have been published or delivered over the past decade or so. I was personally especially pleased to see in its number the essay, Does the Free Market Produce Free Persons?, which was based on an opening statement by Dr. Schindler uh, at a debate that was sponsored uh, in 2009 at Georgetown University for a program that I had founded and led. Um, that was the first time I had met uh, David Schindler. And based on that presentation, uh, my mouth hitting the desk the more I listened in wonder and amazement and admiration. Uh, it was the beginning of my ongoing encounter with his thought and with his writings. <clears throat> Ordering Love thus was not written as a book in 
the usual sense we might think of that, but it is more than a book in the ordinary sense because in it, everything hangs together, I think as has been expressed already, as it must when one's understanding of the cosmos, including the human and the divine, is fundamentally one of integration. All pieces, all parts, all fragments are in relationship with every other piece because everything properly understood ultimately derives from and points toward its relationship with God. While books can sometimes create the image of a false cosmos by picking a piece or part of reality and providing the simulacra of integration by excluding subjects that can't fit within its limited purview, Dr. Schindler almost shows without intention how a fully de developed theological understanding necessarily pulls every apparently separate piece into integral relationship. Education, economics, ecology, science, technology, politics, and culture just for starters, are interwoven as they should be and must be as inseparable parts of an integrated vision of the human good. More often than not, one encounters a book on any of these individual subjects that treats these subjects in separation and thus gives the appearance of comprehensiveness only by exclusion. People write books then about these separate topics but in fact only succeed in a sense in writing chapters. David Schindler has written individual chapters without necessarily intending it, but has written a true book. And thus, in some ways, as he worked on each individual or discrete part, his vision inescapably informed the, uh, and was uh, in some ways informed by the interpenetration between subjects that our age tends to treat in separation, and in the course of connecting the parts achieved a whole. This is certainly a thesis, if not the thesis of the book, and I can't begin to describe the thesis in the ways in which uh, David just did, but this was at least my takeaway. An exposure of how the modern world separates, puts asunder what God wants to be joined together. In every chapter, David Schindler points to the ways in which the modern world craves separation rather than relationship, asserts our apartness rather than our relationality posits the reality of self rather than the deeper reality of love. He points especially to the shadow theology of liberalism as a main source and driver of our contemporary form of structural separation, what he sometimes calls structural indifference or a society of sin. Liberalism, Schindler persuasively argues, while claiming to be neutral about our belief, but the beliefs that we hold and containing no implicit ontology in fact shapes a world in its own image. The juridical liberal state creates, and I quote, a dualistic distinction between state and society. And so, Dr. Schindler argues, and I quote again, thereby hides, hides its identity as a liberal society. Through this very separation, it instantiates, and liberal, uh, it instantiates a liberal ontology albeit one that is hidden behind the claim to neutrality. This separation is itself informed by a deeper and more radical separation presupposed between humanity and God. I think, again, he spoke to this. And from this separation arises the basic impetus to regard all relations, all mediations, as instrumental for the use of individual advantage rather than in a relational context informed by love, and hence an orientation toward others and the world informed by gratitude and giftedness. Insofar as relationships do exist, they arise from the context of separation and an instrumentalism characteristic of a liberal society. Individuals are conceived to be and increasingly conform to the expectation that they can only legitimately act, and I quote, and I quote again, as prematurely self-interested and constructive agents exercising what are logically now voluntaristic freedom and a calculative technical intelligence supported where helpful by a positivistic religion. Throughout this book, Dr. Schindler amasses a powerful and to my mind irrefutable argument of liberalism's substantive ontology, not neutral. One that, again, quote, renders itself invisible as a substantive truth claim. It is an educative philosophy, not neutral, not indifferent. <laughs> One that shapes a world in its image, a world that comes ever more clearly into, into view as, as its alternative catechesis reaches more deeply into every school, every home, and every heart. But I want to suggest that this is at best only an incomplete portrait of liberalism as a modern project. Hewing closely to the realist iteration of liberalism that was originally articulated by the likes of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, and given expression in our own context by the founders of America in establishing our liberal order. 
Dr. Schindler represents, in, by and large, this iteration of liberalism as liberalism in toto, a fiercely realist, and I'm using this term in quotes, realist philosophy that insists upon the inescapability of autonomous self-interest as the fundamental motivation of all human activity. As such, Dr. Schindler devotes his book in significant part to arguing that the counterposition to this fragmentary and fragmenting, fragmenting understanding of human anthropology must centrally feature a reorientation toward a differently conceived self-interest. Quote, self-interest is only most truly realized as self-interest only inside human acts already given dynamic for other-centered love, unquote. But one wonders, and I wonder, if Dr. Schindler's argument would have been differently expressed or would need to be differently emphasized if we conceived of liberalism in a different, or I would argue, fuller way, one that I think captures it even more fully as a comprehensively competing theology and appreciates the fullness of its ambitions. Liberalism's development may begin with the realism of Hobbes and Locke, but quickly developed in a more ideal, again in quotes, and utopian direction, as one sees in the work of such authors as Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Immanuel Kant and John Stuart Mill, and in the United States in thinkers ranging from Emerson and Whitman and Edward Bellamy and John Dewey and Herbert Crowley and even the recently departed Richard Rorty. Reading Schindler, we might be tempted to conclude that the only strain of liberalism present in America, if not the world, is that of our Lockean founding, and surely it is there for those with eyes to see. But this would neglect liberalism's course and even, arguably, its own teleology. Expressed by such thinkers as Hobbes, man is by nature an autonomous and sovereign self, wholly instrumental in orientation and seeking above all self-preservation and beyond that the fulfillment of desires to increase pleasure and avoid pain. Nature is understood to be at once both lacking any normative dimension, but also fundamentally hostile among the greatest threats to our self-preservation and uh, that which threatens the fulfillment or at least prevents the fulfillment of our fullest desires. Following his early employer, his first employer, Francis Bacon, Thomas Hobbes' employer, nature must be brought to heel, conquered by the expansion of knowledge and power that is oriented not toward contemplation and worship, but rather as a means to the expansion of human power and dominion. As Dr. Schindler rightly understands, reflecting the two halves of this book, there is a close, indeed deeply intimate connection between the relativist, instrumentalist, individualist, and hedonistic philosophy of the likes of Hobbes and the technological imperative of Francis Bacon, manifested everywhere today in our public and private lives. But I think it could be reasonably argued and I've done so, uh, that this understanding of humanity and nature is itself instrumental, in a sense, toward a further end, one that one sees more clearly in what we might call the second wave of liberalism. As Rousseau understood, the conquest of nature, as it, as it was articulated by Hobbes and Locke, could not be understood to be merely limited to stuff out there, nature as something separate from us. One could not, after all, finally argue for the plasticity of nature out there and the inviolability and unchangeability of human nature. It is arguable that liberalism necessarily and inescapably takes the next step in asserting that the conquest of nature must necessarily include ultimately human nature. And that implicated in what must be reconstructed is our supposed nature as self-interested and instrumentalist creatures. Thus our instrumentalism ultimately turns in on itself. What is finally to be solved is the problem, among other things, of our self-interest and our instrumentalism. We are to transcend our experience as embodied sel uh, selves, experiencing selfhood, and indeed even overcome separation. Thus the buzz, it seems to me, in many elite circles today is not separation, but convergence. Everything coming to a single point. The complete redefinition, among other things, of human consciousness itself the elimination of any experience of selfhood or ego, the entry into Karl Marx's dream of entering our species being. Contemporary authors, for example, who argue on behalf or sense a coming cosmopolitan convergence will often evoke language at least superficially similar to Dr. Schindler's insisting upon the centrality of love and of self-overcoming as the aim of the liberal project. Indeed, one sees that this movement is contained within liberalism itself. 
It was only through the defeat of the lived experience and ontological belief that human memberships through our families, our communities, and our church constitutes ourselves that we came through by eliminating that experience, that we came to eliminate, uh, uh, we, we, we came to have, a, I'm sorry, an experience of ourselves qua sovereign individuals. And it was only when we had that experience as sovereign individuals that we could in some ways raise our heads and grasp a more utopic philosophical possibility that with no mediating obstacles between ourselves and the cosmos or humanity, our experience of liberation gave rise to the possibility of global reconciliation. And it was only through the, tech, uh, the expansion of the technological project, among what, what, what my, my, one might include Marshall McLuhan's description of the Pentecostal experience to be available to modern man, the possibility of a universally shared consciousness through growing communication that inspired thinkers ranging from Ralph Waldo Emerson, John Dewey, and Herbert Crowley, who all pointed to then cutting edge technologies like the railroad and the telegraph as means to which people being first liberated from their parochial narrow narrowness would become members of what Dewey would call the great community. Richard Rorty, alluding to Walt Whitman, would declare, declare that democratic man had achieved more being, and that just that doesn't mean he's nearly fatter, than a less progressed democratic man. First, humanity needed to be broken down into its parts, separated, and then reassembled as a whole. Technology would not merely be the instru instrumental means of achieving our ends as individuals, but it would, be the end, it would be the means of achieving our true end as species beings. One is arguably less likely to meet Hobbesians today among our elite liberal friends than those longing for a transformation of human nature itself. A figure, and I just name one, an author of a book called Becoming a Cosmopolitan named Jason Hill, who detects the maturation of our collective soul. That's a quote. Dr. Schindler has rightly devoted much of his academic life to exposing the ontological presuppositions that underlie liberalism. But his liberalism seems to me at least to be somewhat static, maybe incomplete. One wonders what kind of book or essays he would write if he were to direct his considerable discernment on this successive wave and tendency within liberalism. Doubtless, he would expose this ontology to be as false as the desiccated understanding of human anthropology in liberalism's first wave. But rather than merely asserting the centrality of love, and I don't mean that merely, in contrast to the instrumentalist vision of the human self, there would need to be a stronger articulation of the reality of the self, the goodness of our embodiedness, even the limits of our capacity to love, not theologically, but in our everyday lives, the people that we love. In other words, whereas Dr. Schindler now articulates what some readers understand to be a utopian vision posed against the realism of, Hob Hob of Hobbesian liberalism, by taking into these accounts within liberalism, he would have to pose a realist argument against the utopianism contained within liberalism. In all particulars, Dr. Schindler has already answered this utopian liberalism as well. In his argument for our givenness, the call to acceptance and even suffering, the gift of our embodiedness, especially our sexual complementarity. In no particular would a fundamentally different argument need to be made. Instead, a different set of emphases would necessarily arise. And I wonder whether such an exercise wouldn't result in part to an answer to the accusation by those liberals, especially market liberals, or what sometimes we call conservatives, who accuse such a work as this of its utopianism and call for a deeper realism. Such a response would require a change in emphasis upon context and structure in which we necessarily experience and indeed in some ways are habituated and learn of such love that does not and cannot extinguish the self. Without reducing the argument to one of politics, there would necessarily need to be in some ways uh, 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 an effort to attend to what would be needed to resist this cosmopolitan or uh, false um, temptation to universalism, oriented rather to the habituation and virtues, including above all love, that does not seek the elimination of self. At the same time, it seems to me, or at least I'd like to think, that such a challenge, such a reflection, would challenge even market liberals to recognize the implicit utopianism within their realism. 
The market, after all, has been a primary engine in, in advancing the belief in an incipient cosmopolitanism and clearly undermines basic structures that have been at the heart of those market liberals' realism, especially the assumption of the finality of the state. Placing the market within the ecology of love is not only a corrective to the realist emphasis upon self-interest, but to the utopian idealism of the cosmopolites and those who would seek our transformation. Among others, the, I think, Augustinian political theorist Pierre Manon, a French thinker, has been making a number of these arguments in defense of a politics that focuses upon limited scale based upon the truth of our human anthropology. Here, writing in particular against the utopian impulse uh, within the European project. It seems to me it would be extraordinarily valuable for someone like Dr. Schindler or one of his students with close associations to engage with this school and these arguments in the development of a realist response to these trends. Throughout this book, Dr. Schindler insists again and again that his position is the realist position against the anthropological falsity of liberalism. And while I think this is doubtlessly true, it is nevertheless the, the fact that those who read him often see uh, less of an emphasis upon realism because it may be less visible because it itself, uh, it itself too readily accepts a truncated understanding of the liberal human and human being that does not fully capture the entirety of liberalism's movement to court and overlooks or downplays the utopian kernel embedded within the liberal project. Without changing the fundamental content of his critique, it seems to me a more thorough critique of liberalism would foster in some senses a balanced and fuller critique, inviting a more obviously realist response that would be cognizant then of the political and social conditions and organizations that would be required for combating a utopian liberalism. This is a project that continues since, of course, the challenge itself unfolds in the flow of time. The answer remains eternal, the order of love, but how it is expressed will need to be adapted to time and place. Dr. Schindler has given us a very powerful defense of that order, one that rightly inspires reasons to build a kingdom of love inspired by the anamnesis, the memory of God. It remains to those of us who admire and learn from him uh, to, and who, who continue to learn from him to work in our several parts for building that whole of which he has pointed us. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Is this on? No? Is it on? No. Yeah, it is. What's wrong with you? Um, I, I first just want to thank uh, Peter and Patrick uh, for their thoughtful, uh, generous papers and um, very helpful. And uh, uh, the first thing I would say is just to begin by um, uh, acknowledging the need uh, to, to develop uh, these points that they raise, uh, um, that uh, all of which the, the main points they raise seem to me very important. And um, we do want to have some participation from the audience, but I'd like to say maybe uh, a response to uh, quickly to each of them sort of a direction of a response and, uh, and then uh, afford opportunity for people to raise questions. But um, I didn't, I mean, despite the title, I didn't say a lot about the memory of God in my presentation here. And um, uh, uh, Peter raises uh, a lot of uh, interesting um, um, thoughts there. I don't know the metaphysics of Chivada the book is now sitting on my desk, and uh, it looks pretty intimidating, but it's a book that one must read, The Analogy of Being. Um, Chivada is a man that Baltazar once said is the most intelligent man he ever met, so that heightens the uh, intimidation. <laughs> uh, 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 but uh, the memory of God, you know, just a couple of quick uh, comments that don't capture everything, but... Um, uh, you know, and, and, and being static, if I, the, the question of rhythm, I just don't understand enough what Chivada means by that to respond to that. But, you know, I would say that there's a, there's a nature um, 
and uh, it doesn't imply that it's static. I mean, it's, it's, it's developing in history, but uh, that the memory of God is not, it's not as though, um, I mean, I, I've had an, another person raise that question pretty sharply to me uh, and says, well, somehow God's there, but uh, nobody knows it. I mean, you're, you're, you're making uh, confusing, confusing an epistemic claim with an ontological claim. And a lot has to be sorted out there, and I would only say that uh, it seems to me, and the question of the real distinction, I mean, this is utterly profound, and you have to, um, it takes a lot of work to show how uh, that implicit awareness um, implies ultimately uh, some, uh, uh, I mean, some ultimate source of the true and the good and some distinction between being and beings and an openness to God. Uh, but of course, it's clouded by history and by sin and so forth, and it's not something that just is there all the time. It's something that's rather profound. In, in a sense, it's the, the things that are omnipresent that are the hardest thing to identify. You know, it's sort of like saying, where's air? You say, well, there's some there, and there's some there. You find out you're breathing it. Um, and the, the reality of God is, is something like that, and the, and the reality of being. But the second thing I would say there, and, I, and, and you know, I, I haven't gotten a lot of resonance in conversation sometimes uh, uh, on, on the implicit, the, the sense of when Aquinas says, I, I, I love God and I know God implicitly in everything that I know and love. The Latin is implicite. And, uh, you know, what is this implicit? What does it mean to be implicitly aware? It's not thematic, but it is a, an awareness of a sort. And, um, and I think that, uh, I mean, one has to be careful, but I think Ratzinger is right about that, and I, I, there's much more that I have to <coughs> say about that, uh, 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 certainly to develop it. Um, and uh, now quickly on the, uh, a couple of uh, points of Patrick regarding liberalism. Uh, uh, that's so interesting uh, what he says, and I would say this distinction in liberalism I, I would basically say I'm guilty uh, as charged in the sense that my focus has been primarily on Locke and on the Catholic appropriation of the liberal tradition so that I, I admit that I'm very influenced by Murray, not, not that he has a correct reading of liberalism, but that his reading is sort of dominant. And it's the sort, sort of more apparently benign kind of liberalism and that, that, that Catholics think can be accommodated so readily. I mean, in the political order, you know, that it allows a civil <coughs> unity without explicitly invoking a religious unity and so forth. Um, and the, the way he reads society. I, I mean, basically, the, the, there I would, I would simply say that um, I think that that more or less benign uh, liberalism is not so benign that it ends up in the same place as the more aggressive liberalism of Hobbes and, and the others. And that's sort of the point, that it, it's, it's not something that we can sort of graft onto because um, it gives us, you know, sort of empty institutions uh, that, that, that don't embody a vision of reality or of God, and then we can sort of work with those. And I think that's deceptive, and so I focused in primarily on one strain as it's been appropriated, but I agree with him, and uh, I mean, I, and, and he knows much more about the history of this than I do, but I don't think uh, that, you know, in the end, we would, we would differ on, on, on these things, but I, I haven't, my, my, I, I've developed it in too limited a context. And uh, then things about, you know, love being the aim of the liberal project, I, we could deal with that pretty quickly. I mean, it's a question of what you mean by love and the contractual sense of love in, in liberalism. But that gets mistaken because uh, Catholicism <coughs> has inherited uh, in, in so many ways uh, unconsciously what is criticized by Pinkers, you know, a, a conception of the human act as sort of an empty act of freedom, and then we can, you know, we can, we, we, of course we're in favor of relations, but we contract them, rather than seeing that the human being is, is in relationship uh, from the beginning. Uh, and then the, the uh, thing about the ideal, that is 
uh, thank you for the way you put that. I mean, that's a very rich way that you develop that. And absolutely, it's at the core of something that needs to be uh, de developed more. Uh, I mean, a couple of just basic things off the top of my head would be one is the first point I always like to make in those discussions is, first of all, ideals are real. That's the first point. Uh, ideals are not unreal. In fact, you make the case they're the most real thing. In other words, I ask all of you, why'd you get out of bed this morning? Now you say, I mean, mechanically and so on, but ultimately you do it day in and day out, and why do you do it? You're seeking meaning, you're seeking the good. Uh, you, you wanna serve God, you love someone. Uh, the point is, th those, those basic ideals go to the core of our being, they're not just sort of tacked on, and they're structured into our nature, the, the deepest of those, they're structured into our nature, and then, and, and, and it's just, I, I don't want to, you know, sort of use a shibboleth here or a, a slogan, but we're called to sanctity. We're called to the realization of that. And that has to be sort of the starting point and the, and the point, the reference point that's, that's real all along. And, and, and then the entailments of that, there's, no, there's nothing in, in a, an adequate understanding of the, the human being in light of Christianity that, that guarantees that this is gonna work and be widely em, embraced. I, I mean, uh, without suffering and without the cross. I mean, that, that it isn't going to be reversed and um, false starts and so on. Uh, but but that's, that's the point of history is, now that has to be taken into account. I mean, how then do you organize a society? But for, you know, it's the old question that's raised that somehow you want to em embody the form uh, that, that uh, indicates what a human being is and meant for, and then you want a structure that allows for the fact that, well, basically, not everybody's going to live that, and how do you deal with that problem? And then, and sort of to sort it out. But a key point there is what we don't do enough of is, is to help people see there's joy in that. Um, you know, it isn't just I have to do my duty. It's the only way of finding meaning. We, and and all this talk of suffering, you know, and the poor and so on. Absolutely, let's talk about that. But the worst form of poverty is meaninglessness. That, the, the, that no coherence. Why get up in the morning? Why even go look for food? Now, there's a certain animal level, you know, to eat. But it's the meaning question that goes to the core. And that's realistic, and we stumble, and we're broken, and so on, but that's there. And, and uh, I, I, you know, that's just a, a first start there on the, on the question of realism. I mean, where do you go with that? That, that uh, the form of things that we're always sort of struggling to fit into the form to which we're called and which is built into our being as given. So anyway, so I, I think, um, um, uh, I, I'll stop talking. I don't know if you have comments, but I guess if people, we have uh, 15 minutes or so for questions and further discussion. So any questions, comments? No disagreements, nothing? Yeah. No. yeah. Um, well, I, I think what you're saying is very good and very true, but it sounds really radical and I can't really live that way or I can't, I will never be able to make an impact on the world or on culture, on society or in politics if I start spouting these kinds of things because they're totally impractical and, you know, politics is the art of the possible and this is just not possible. So we might as well accept that fact and work with what we have because I hear that all the time, right. and especially in D.C. No. <laughs> no, you know, I, exactly. But you know, you take flesh. I mean, I know that sounds sort of ca like can't, I mean, C-A-N-T. But uh, <laughs> that, that uh, you, you, ta you take flesh and um, wh what we, and, and this is, there's so many aspects of this, you know. Uh, we forget, I mean, we live in a society where, where dialogue is virtually impossible. Serious dialogue requires being in a place, sharing 
a life sharing, uh, a way of life sharing uh, um, uh, an occupation, day in and day out, building friendship. And, and that it's out of friendship that these kinds, and, and outside that context, I, I think it's not possible. Outside the context of friendship, and therefore, uh, so many global things, it seems to me, um, of their nature are problematic. I mean, how do you dialogue? I mean, you know, committee meetings, uh, commissions, uh, gatherings of experts, and so on. It's not that they don't have a place, uh, but it's secondary. And, and the proposal has to be here and now in, the, in my family, my roots, and the people that through the course of my history <coughs> I've been brought, uh, whose lives I've been brought into. And, and to stay in that place. You know, we're so keen on neglecting the place and then going global. Uh, it, where it's going to happen is day in and day out. You, you then have the conversation over lunch. Well, what do you think about this? Why, why do you do this? And, and it seems to me that, that some form of that is necessary for any kind of dialogue. And I would say, especially the dialogue we, we need today. The dialogue we need today is the one Benedict says. It has to be a dialogue about the whole of reality and its deepest meaning. He constantly is saying that. The questions now go to the roots of our being. And of course, the first thing in our culture is to is to uh, generate an awareness that they have questions. And that's going to happen only by living with them and getting to know them and then talking about, you know, my life isn't fulfilled. Well, why not? And so on. So that, that uh, you know, that's, that is, is, is uh, at least one element, it seems to me, of a response to that. Yeah. By not waiting for the, the, the big position, I mean, is, is that what you're kind of going for? Yeah, it, the point is we need to start from where we've been brought historically. It's that simple. And we, we all have, uh, you know, we have uh, fathers and mothers, we have siblings, we, we have a genetic, uh, a genea genealogical history. Uh, we come from a place, now the problem is so much of that now doesn't mean anything. And that's already one of the problems. You don't, you're not located. But to be in, in a place, of, like right now, we're here. I mean, so we, we talk to each other here, and then we have friendships, and we have d deep friendships, and so on. I mean, but the, the key thing, I know that can sound a little question begging, but in the end, it has to be something like that. We, we have to start from where we've been brought historically. And history is already a revelation of, of providence. I mean, barring the sin and so on, but even the sin, God works with it. I mean, you've been brought to a certain place, and you start looking for something global instead of going to the depths of where you are. I mean, th this is the thing when I say the goodness of creation. Peeper, when he's talking about the end of time, and really, in a sense, he thinks we are there. Uh, the only thing is I, I kind of laughed at one point. He said, we will know the Antichrist, and he ticks off, and he's Solovius things, you know, and, and he says, we'll know the Antichrist because he'll be a vegetarian. And I says, oh, I said, rats, you know, that lose it, that, that destroys my current theory, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know some of the people I was thinking about, they're not vegetarians. Okay, but the, 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 the point is that we, we uh, anyway, I, I've said enough. That, that, I've, there's something I want to say there, but I lost it. Oh like yeah, can I say it? Came back to me. <laughs> Michael, one second. What Pieper says, it's pertinent to what he says. He says, you know, basically the difficult times we're in, he says, so what should we do? Suppose we really are and, and uh, things are approaching. What does he say? Affirm the goodness of creation and fulfill your task. That's the point. That's the point. Uh yeah. I'd just like to provoke you about the UN report. Um, you asked well, about you, that. Gonna, but but also I saw it? just uh, Patrick you nodding your head when he, when he mentioned that. And I, and I wonder if you might say something about it as well in light of your treatment of a kind of uh, reconstitution of universalism through, uh, through a sort of liberal utopia. Maybe if you could both speak. I'm curious. Um, what, I mean, do you want, yeah. Patrick, do you want to go ahead? 
first? I actually would really like to hear what you have to say. <laughs> well, now, you know, to me, it is grotesque. The statement is grotesque. I mean, you read through, I, I highly encourage you to read it, 16 pages. What's the point? It is censuring, I can go through a whole side things, the structure of it. So, but the point is, it's censuring Rome, the Vatican, the Holy See, censuring the Holy See because they don't uh, care, show enough care and concern for children and don't respect adequately the rights of children. It spells out what that means. And the grotesqueness is, to me, and then, you know, then it involves things about sexual orientation and not discriminating and so on and so forth. But what, what's the, it does that in the context of um, explicit affirmation. I mean, it's, it's obvious anyway, but it's an explicit <laughs> affirmation of abortion. So, I mean, I mean uh, the grotesqueness of that, the killing of innocence. I mean, what are we in the hundreds of millions? And I don't mean to be dramatic here, just this is the fact. And in that context, they're lecturing Rome on the rights of children. And, and they spill that out. To me, a priori, that's grotesque. And, and the second point there, um, in terms of uh, it, it, its conception of uh, marriage, it instrumentalizes the distinctive communion of persons between a man and a woman, which alone, objectively speaking, can secure the integrity of the dignity of the child. You have there, and, and this is advanced, this is pro proposed in the name of the rights of the child. I, I, I mean, I find it grotesque, but I also think it will be, the, the substance of that, if you read it, will be the law of uh, every major Western democracy in 10 years. I, I mean, maybe somebody would disagree with me on that. Um, that's worth pondering, it seems to me. So I could say more about what they say. I mean, about how they, uh, they instruct how the church needs to reread scripture in order not to justify corporate punishment. And uh, they have to uh, alter their authority structure so as not to do this and so on. But I, I leave all that aside. The core point is the two that I made. Yep. I, I, would echo all that. Uh, I, I think it's just um, another piece of uh, a growing body of evidence that suggests that while um, you could say in its, in its early phases, uh, the liberal project in some ways posited a theoretical condition of human beings in which we were autonomous sovereign selves in the state of nature um, and suggested that human society came about as the result of voluntarist contractual um, instrumental uh, relationships and bonds. In point of fact, it seems to me that the end, the sort of the end goal of the liberal societies, in some ways, to make us into those creatures that it theoretically posits we are in the state of nature. That is to say, it makes us into autonomous, sovereign selves, whether we want to be or not. And anything that stands in the way of that project must be uh, uh, disassembled, uh, because it's not neutral as to what kind of human beings we ultimately are. And my only, my only point of, of um, uh, what I wanted to at least point out is that uh, it seems to me that this is bound up in a deeper belief that w once everyone is in some ways liberated from their biology, from any arbitrary relationship of family, community, um, religion, etc., then we are free finally to see ourselves in our full humanity. And that's as false a vision as in some ways as the vision, the idea that we are freely choosing as sovereign selfhood. It's as false. Um, and I think you know, David's argument could be, could be easily rendered in that direction. But that falsehood will do as much damage to us as human beings as the belief that we can turn ourselves into sovereign selves. Much mischief and much destruction will be done in the name of it. Um, so it seems to me that we need to have a f the fullest understanding, I think, of what, in some ways, the teleology, if I can call it that, of liberalism is. And I think this is one piece of that that we're seeing unfolding right before our eyes. In um, Aristotle's treatment of friendship, he talks about it, the kind of the nature of friendship is the desire of the other. Uh, our Holy Father now speaks in the Spanish term of encuentro, the encounter. Do you see this encuentro that Francis is speaking of this encounter as consistent with what Blessed John Paul II has spoken of, what 
Benedict has spoken about, about in, in this kind of communio sense of dialogue. You mentioned dialogue with others, dialogue with persons and... and yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, that, that there, there's a lot there in the, in the relationship. You know, I, I think it is important to remember also uh, the, the developments in the pontificates of, of John Paul II and Benedict XVI that need to be presupposed and continue on. I mean, I think that those two pontificates are uh, watershed moments and for, for per, in perpetuity uh, they will represent the decisive, the watershed really of the meaning of Vatican II. And I think uh, uh, Pope Francis really um, does presuppose that and affirm that. And, um, and I think has to be understood also in that light as, as continuous with that. Can I say yeah. Um, I think the reason why people uh, use the Spanish is because you can translate Encuentro as a meeting. <laughs> like I have a meeting or I meet someone. And so that, that cultura de encuentro that was very important for Bergoglio and now for Pope Francis, it, it actually shows the continuity, as Professor Schindler was saying, with the, um, the, the dialogue with the other that um, I think uh, Pope Benedict Ratzinger took out of Augustinian thinking. But it also speaks to what was just said about the UN report and liberalism, because the cultura de encuentro has within it the, the sharing of food and the sharing of flesh and the seeing people face to face. And that's, I think, the, the element of Gnostic return that we're seeing in these accounts of going beyond the biblical account, going beyond parenting, going beyond the body. Just some thoughts about that encuentro. Dr. Schindler and uh, Dr. Neen, I think you've both uh, addressed the way in which the church is sometimes complicit uh, in its defense of religious liberty, um, complicit in sort of perpetuating the logic of liberalism, um, sort of arguing for the church's freedom, you know, casting the church as kind of another organization amongst others that it's entitled to the same sort of freedom. And so I guess my question for you, both, um, and be Dr. Casarella, is some ideas about how the church kind of proposes its place in the public square without being sort of complicit in, in that logic that you sort of uh, alluded to. You can have the hard ones. Well. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're referring to a piece that I wrote maybe uh, a year or two ago in which, um, on the one hand, I, I, I acknowledged and, and fully supported the efforts to protect the freedom of the church, which is sometimes called religious liberty. Uh, I think it would be better for us to begin by calling it freedom of the church. Um, but, uh, uh, but supporting that as a, as a necessary defense of the church's liberty uh, in an increasingly and aggressively secular age. But I also wanted to argue in that that we shouldn't confuse in some ways a prudential tactic with the thing itself, what it, what it is we're trying to do. And that the prudential tactic, in some ways, has to, t in some ways, be pitched and uh, argued in the form in which liberal society recognizes a legitimate argument, which is precisely as you describe that we're just a, a private organization that has strange beliefs, uh, and the Constitution protects our weird beliefs, um, and so our weird beliefs should be permitted to flourish within our private organization. Um, but of course, that's not the church's view on these matters, and so we. Uh, so it seemed to me that at least it was necessary that along with the bishop's strong articulation of a defense of religious liberty, it should also, from the pulpits and from the public stage, wherever it could be, be declaring the substance of what the Catholic position and belief was. Um, and that, um, at base, this wasn't a defense of our liberty as a private association. Um, and in fact, that it should be willing to get up and defend in ways that it hasn't its position concerning birth control, its position concerning um, um, well, it certainly has regarding abortion, but, but certainly not uh, in, in my, my lifetime contraception. That said, I think it's very interesting what's happening. I may be just in a weird part of the blogosphere, Facebookosphere, 
I've seen more discussion of contraception uh, and serious discussion. There's, there's discussion taking place among evangelical Protestants, uh, whether or not, I've seen some people writing articles, whether or not the Catholic teaching was in fact correct. Um, I've seen more discussion of this as a topic uh, than certainly in, over the course of my lifetime. That's encouraging. I mean, it's obviously taking place in the context and a backdrop in which we're sort of having a discussion that we might not have otherwise had. Um, but in other words, uh, that, uh, that, we should, that the church should not simply, there was a danger of simply um, em embracing the liberal language of private defense of private association uh, that would become in some ways ultimately self-undermining of its, of its more fundamental position. And that you know, alongside the prudential embrace of that strategy, there needed to be a full-throated articulation of the, act of, of the church's actual understanding of its role and place in society. Yeah, I would endorse that completely. Um, <clears throat> and I would um, maybe draw out a little bit the role of the laity and the need for education and formation in the church. But, you know, this vision, we, we you know, it's the old, it's, uh, you're in a position like, it's sort of, well, you're kind of embarrassed, you know, we're against contraception. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than seeing, look, at, this is part of a whole and uh, this gives us an understanding of the whole human being and, and uh, why life is worth living and so on and so forth. And um, uh, that we, we need to be formed in that, both understanding it and living it as a, as a way of being, and then have lay people inside the culture, from inside the structures of society, uh, capable of, of presenting it and uh, I mean living it and and then being able to give an account of what it is they live uh, an account for that and uh, we, we you know that that, and that that is such a complicated historical <coughs> problem you know I mean what happened in that I mean not that it, it's too simple to say you know the church made a mistake and all of that but you know, where has been the formation in that and the articulation? I asked people here uh, when they were coming through the uh, growing up, how were they formed in these things? I mean, to see that this is a vision of the human being is just sort of, you know, you can't do this in sex sort of thing. It's a vision of the human being. What's a body? You know, why are we dictated to by a 17th century view of the body, which is absolutely pervasive and assumed without question in all these discussions. The body is stuff for manipulation. And the idea that the shape of the body is, says something about the nature of love is absolutely off the radar. I mean, again, it's the providentiality of John Paul II, it seems to me, uh, and why he, we need to keep that alive. But in any case, yeah. <laughs> That's a signal in the institute. Let us thank once again our speakers tonight and uh, there's a reception of the